Turning points change the course of our lives. Whether it's a big decision, overcoming an obstacle or tragedy, or taking a leap of faith, these stories of inspiration and resilience are what Turning Point is all about. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this first episode of season two of Turning Point. I'm your host, Priya Sam, and if you're watching this, you'll see that I have a different background today. I'm at Fanshawe College in London, Ontario. Fanshawe College is one of our sponsors this season, and I actually graduated from the broadcast journalism program here in 2006. It marked a major turning point in my life, so this partnership really couldn't be more perfect. Now, the interview you're about to hear is with Entertainment Tonight Canada host, Cheryl Hickey. She is also a Fanshawe alum. She graduated from the broadcast journalism program here as well. This interview was recorded during a live event on October 13th. I'm also very happy today to be joined by another Fanshawe alum. Cheryl Hickey graduated from the broadcast journalism program here in 1996. You likely know her from her role as the host of Entertainment Tonight Canada. Cheryl has been hosting the show since 2005. Um, that's actually when the show launched. And tonight you'll get to hear the story of how Cheryl got the job. It's a great story. And of course, it marked a major turning point in her life as well. Cheryl, thank you so much for being here. And Cheryl knows how to turn on the camera. I mean, it's only <laughs> been two years of doing this from home, right? So it's got hi, hey, nice to see you. Priya. It's so nice to see you too. And thank you so much for being here. I've um I've always like wa loved following your career, and I think it's really cool that we actually uh, went to the same program and both started here at Fanshawe. I feel the same way. I think it's a pretty good school. Hi, Jim. I know you're in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a it's a great place to learn and grow. That's for absolutely. Sure. So before we get to ET Canada, I actually want to go way back to your teen years because you actually had your first experience at a television station when you were in high school. Um, you were 16 and you were a volunteer there. So how did you end up doing that? Mm -hmm. Well, I would have to credit my father because I was spending my summers <clears throat> at a place called Sobble Beach. And I would be, you know, playing beach volleyball in the daytime and you know, working and, and going to dunes parties at night. And my dad was like, listen, we need to do a little bit. And when I say working, I was a hostess at a, a club. So like, wait, that didn't come out right. A hostess at a club where there was a boat. And anyway, okay. or anyway and he said, you know, we really need you. you. You really need to think about what you want to do. And he's like, you love to talk. So a crawl had come across the screen uh, at home and it had said they were looking for volunteers at the cable station. He goes like, let's just go there, check it out, see what it's all about. So I did. And <clears throat> immediately I was fascinated by the multitude of jobs that it took to get things to air. It wasn't so much the person on air I was fascinated with. It was everything else that surrounded it. Um, and that it sort of just snowballed from there. It's so interesting because um, one thing that you and I also have in common is that we both started our, our careers behind the scenes. And um, I think that that was something that really stood out to me too um, from both my first jobs and also um, my time um, at Fanshawe because you, you do learn everything. You know, a lot of people kind of come wanting to be that on-air person. But um, I think it, it is, like you said, you, you learn so much about just how much goes into making those shows happen. Um, and speaking of that, you know, your next stop after that volunteer uh, position was here at Fanshawe. You host an entertainment show um, now, of course, but take me back to your time here at Fanshawe. Did you have a specific career goal in mind? Um. <clears throat> No, I, see, I, I mean, I, I suppose a little bit. I always loved watching Barbara Walters and I loved interviewing people, but I also really fell in love with the editing process. There was something magical about that. Um, and also the artistry of camera work. It's so intricate and it, it is such a big part of telling the story. So I just feel like there are so many different components to telling a good story that the more you walk in the shoes of the people that do those jobs, the better you will be at whatever job you end up specializing in. I just did a TikTok move. Did anybody notice that? If I did that? I love anyway, it. Anyway, <laughs> I, right? I just throw that in there. And I just think it's super important to have walked in those shoes to, to make yourself 
um, more appreciative of all the pieces that go into um, it and and just to to help you tell your story it makes it richer yeah absolutely I'm I, I, being back here at Fanshawe has been bringing back I know I mentioned this kind of all of these um, memories here I've been thinking about the classmates um, that I had here um, running the campus station um, reading the newswires and all of those things that that really helped me as I got my first job um, what stands out to you about your time here at Fanshawe sleep deprivation and fear <laughs> oh, oh. and it's kind of true it's kind of true bob bucks there were these things called bob bucks that were very famous back yep. then mm -hmm. um yeah i think i was 17 years old when i came to fanshawe and i re from a small town um this was my first time away from home i was petrified i was terrified and i think i found a home at fanshawe um at that time the program was two years and the year after i left they evolved it into three and i was like no kidding you packed a lot into two years it was a bit much um but i think i really learned how to just not give up when things got really hard um that if you dig deeper there's always a way there's always a way and in this business trusting in yourself and knowing that there is a way is really important because there will be more people that tell you it is the most terrible time to get into the industry and there are no jobs people have been saying that since the very beginning of time and i think that is people looking at this industry in the wrong way look at it as opportunity there's opportunity more now than there has ever been for creating content everything from the internet to social media to companies and what they need like it is so large it's an exciting time to be in this industry so i think um what was your question <laughs> i love this i love where we went with this no but i mean what stood out to you about your time at fanshawe and i think that you really encapsulate what you just said there you know finding those opportunities and yeah. and you know and digging deeper in those harder times and looking at, at at the possibilities because i think that has been such a theme in your career you have evolved so much through all of your different roles and you know you went from a small station in owen sound all the way to where you are in toronto you also have hosted an hgtv show you have like all of your social media accounts so so you answered the question <laughs> oh, thank you. I think, you know, it's, it's just, it's, uh, it's a journey. I mean, I've heard more no's than I've had yeses. It just so happens that a couple of the yeses have landed me in this position, but I truly believe it's, it's a situation where preparedness and luck meet. You can be the luckiest person in the world, but if you're not ready, it's not going to matter. You're not going to be able to notice those points that are going to propel you to the next situation that's going to make you great if you're not prepared and being prepared is doing those jobs that maybe you don't think fit into what you want to do but that's being prepared that's getting ready that's ge the reason i got this job in toronto was because it wasn't because of my on air it was because of the camera work that i was doing and they needed a, a camera operator in a helicopter and someone who wanted to try something new and i kept trying things new at my job at the new VR and dairy. And that's what got me the job. It wasn't my hair or how I talked or any of those things. It was just, it was preparedness. Yeah. And I know we have, um, on the call, some, some students, so, um, watching this. So I think that that's such a great piece of advice that, um, you know, to remember that you do kind of go through, um, those, those jobs where you're not necessarily doing your dream job, but it, it does prepare you for those opportunities. So Cheryl, okay. We're in 1996. Now you graduate with your diploma in broadcast journalism from Fanshawe. Where do you land that first job? Mm, I went home again. I was I was just nervous and excited, and I thought I wanted my first job to be back at home because I think that's everybody's instinct. You want to go home after college. At least it was mine. Um, and I worked at the radio station there as a. I think my first job was a summer events reporter, which was the best job in the world. I traveled around in a cruiser. I gave away prizes, and I went back to the beach. Right, it all ends up back at the beach. Um, so that was my first job. And then I became a, a city council reporter 
And then I started anchoring one of the new shifts. Wow. Okay. I, I think it's really cool actually that you went back to, um, back to your hometown, which was Owen Sound. Shout out to Owen Sound for anyone, mm -hmm. uh, anyone joining us from there. So um, after this, you made the move to television and you, um, I know you mentioned it, uh, the new VR in, in Barrie. Um, you wore a lot of hats here. You were a production assistant, a news writer, a camera operator. And I think it's important to mention too that um, it was still pretty rare at this time to have women who, who were camera operators operators. So what was your experience like? Um, <clears throat> listen, my experience when I started at the new VR and Barry was as a writer and I developed incredible anxiety writing for the six o'clock news anchor. I, I couldn't write a tease. I froze. I couldn't get the words out. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And I remember thinking, Oh, I'm not cut out for this. Like I, I, but just the stress of him saying my words was just too much for me to bear. And I remember really having to push through that and push through that. And then I wanted to learn, like I learned a bit of camera at Fanshawe, but then, you know, tech evolves and cameras were changing. So I would follow the cameramen after my shift and one camera woman, I would ask them after my shift at six, if I could go out with them on the night shift and learn how to shoot. So they taught me how to shoot. Um, and then I started alongside with one of the cameras that was kind of broken um, I would shoot alongside them to see if my video matched up to their video, if I could get it as good as theirs. Um, and then when everyone would go home after the 1130 newscast, I would sit and edit my piece together and see if I could get it to look like broadcast material. So I kept doing that and kept doing that and kept doing that. And eventually they hired me on as, as a camera woman. So then I started being the camera woman for a lot of reporters going out on stories, everything from, oh my goodness, I remember going on a hostage uh, taking story. I remember doing weather, um, court again, um, crime, all kinds of different stories, fun stories too, skiing up north and things like that. And then the program director said to me, listen, kiddo, we've got five minutes we need to fill in between a soap opera. We don't know what we want to do with it, but if we gave you that five minutes, do you think you could fill it with something? And I was like, yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. And I went home and I was like, what do you do? And remember, oh, well, and what do you do? So I was like, okay, it's in the middle of a soap opera. I am going to email one of those guys in the back of the magazines that says it's the soap opera in the back of the soap opera digest. And I'm going to get people to email in their questions. I'm going to send the questions to him. And then I'm going to, we're going to have a talk about it for five minutes. We're going to talk about the storyline and the plot of the soap. So they're like, okay, boom, that's what we're going to do. And they said, but where are you going to do this? I said, I don't know. So I went and talked to the maintenance man. And he said, we've got this old uh, makeup room in the back garage by the trucks, by where the exhaust comes out of the big truck. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Like, you can have that room. You can do whatever you want. I go in and it's filled with old paint cans and old boxes. So after my shift, I stayed and I cleaned out the room. And I went back to my maintenance guy and I was like, do you have any paint? He's like, I got this old purple paint you can have. I'm like, purple, perfect. Great. Stayed up, painted all the walls purple and put like some kind of silver. It was terrible. I found a ceramic cat in the back from someone's old set thing. That became my co-host. Boom, we were on air. And one of the girls, we were trying to think of what a name would be for the show. And I remember this girl, I can't remember her name now, but she leaned out of her office and she said, I know because it's in the middle of a soap opera, we'll call it Lather Up with Cheryl Hickey. And I was like, no. And then the news director, or sorry, the program director was like, yes. And my dad was so angry. He was like, really? This is your first time on air and this is the program you have? <laughs> he was so disappointed. But I will say this program went on to, it went on for, even after I left, it was going on for a few years. And it was the first kind of thing of its kind. Um, like we, now there's lots of after shows and all kinds of things like that. But we kind of, I, we, and, we and the cat, we kind of did it originally there. And it was really fun. It was really innocent and just, just learning to ad lib. That's where I kind of got the gift for the ad lib. I think this also, I mean, just in carrying on with that theme of, of being industrious and being willing to evolve, I mean, you spend these extra hours going out, learning how to use the camera, learning how to shoot stories, and then 
mm-hmm. there's an opportunity for you to do this. And I, I mean, I think not everyone would have done what you did and found this room and painted it and, and kind of made, made something out of, out of nothing there. So I, I love, I love that story. I think, I think it actually really kind of, um, explains uh, a lot of, of who you are too and how you've continued to evolve and, and create new things. That's really cool. Well, I think one of the biggest things I could say to people <clears throat> in this industry right now, if their door is not open for you, make your own door. Go to the hardware store, make a door, open it up. Create something for yourself. You know, create create a podcast, create a YouTube series, do something so you are evolving and growing you're not waiting for someone to give you a job so you can grow into it. Get growing. Like there's no, you don't need to waste any time. Get going, figure out what that is. And that was me at nighttime, sitting, learning to edit, sitting, learning to do those things. Um, They weren't going to give me a job right away. They just, they were not. And I knew it. So I had to show them why I would be good for the job. So, yeah. And obviously you did. So at at this point, I mean, you have, a lot of really invaluable experience um, and you're mostly in kind of small and medium-sized markets but then of course the big city comes uh, calling in 1999. This is a big turning point for you. Um, You moved to Toronto uh, for a job with Global Toronto. Um, You're a chopper reporter which um, for anyone who doesn't know what that is we're going to learn more about it, but something um, a lot of people might not know about you is that you actually had a fear of heights and you still took this job where you were very far uh, off the ground. So what compelled you to do that? Um, probably the fear of having to think, what if, like, what if I didn't take it and then what, right? So I got a call one day from the news director in Toronto at the time it was Paul Rogers. And it was from one of my co-cameramen at the new VR. And he said, Paul wants to talk to you. I've told him a little bit about you. This is from Greg. I've told him a little bit about you and they're looking for someone in Toronto and and he just wants to come up and just meet you. And I'm like, he wants to come and meet me. Like, are you kidding me? So I went to Le Chateau and I bought a pinstripe suit, a burgundy, the most flashy, like I thought I was it. And I remember sitting in my car, waiting to go into a coffee shop, thinking, what are we going to talk about? Like, what do I have to offer this guy from Toronto Global News? And he drove up here to talk to me about what, like what? And I remember him saying, like, where do you see yourself in five years? And I was like, oh, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know where I see myself in five years, but I, this is what I know about myself. And I went on to tell him that I like to try new things and um, I was excited for opportunity and that I'm a quick learner and all those things. Um, Cause I wasn't so quick to say, this is my plan because I think you have to be open to what the plan could be. Right. And that's where they said, we are looking for a videographer for the five thirty news. Um, but we're also developing this position where we're building this helicopter with a gimbal on the bottom. And you'll have to learn how to be a cameraman, a TV switcher, and you'll do on-camera throws to your stories and potentially to other people's stories. And I was like, yeah, yeah, totally. That's okay. Yeah, I can do that. Meanwhile, terrified of heights, not good with heights at all. And in fact, when I did get the job, I had to eat a sleeve of saltine crackers just to get through the one hour flight every day. And that's not a joke. Like I would sweat from here to there to like up my back and would never wear pastel, always had to wear black when I was in the chopper because I sweat. It wasn't a glisten, it wasn't cute, it was sweaty. (laughs) So yeah, taking that job was because I I didn't want to have to look at myself and say, well, what would happen if you didn't do it? Fanshawe College's continuing education programs are one reason the college is a leader in part-time adult education. These programs are designed to upgrade your skills and enhance your career. All of the courses are part-time and most are delivered asynchronously online. Whether you're an entrepreneur looking to gain a new skill, someone getting ready to re-enter the workforce, or a professional looking to learn something completely new, Fanshawe really has something for everyone. Registration for winter courses is now open. I still, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't have like a 
strong fear of heights, but I don't love them. And I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine uh, doing that, having a fear of heights. And also, um, I know on our little pre-interview call, you told me a little bit about your day. And I think it would be really interesting um, for, for everyone to hear what a day looked like for you in that job. Because it's like, um, unlike anything I've, I've ever heard. <laughs> well, at the time I was living in Barrie still, because again, I lived in a lot of fear. I was a small town girl, like very nervous of like everything. Still am kind of. Um, so I wasn't going to move to Toronto. Like, no, I'm going to commute every day. It's going to be great. Anyway, they gave me the 3.30 to 11.30 shift. So I would commute in those times and come in, get my assignment for the day, pack up all my gear, go out and shoot my story. Maybe it was at Pearson. Maybe it was downtown. Now, remember, coming from Owen Sound, coming from Barrie, I hadn't driven one day in the city of Toronto. Not a one. Never on a highway. No clue. They gave me the keys to a brand new company car. <laughs> and a bunch of equipment and we're like you better get back here because we got we have to edit soon and you need to and again you talk about sweat I was dying I remember calling my mom bawling on the 401 being like I don't know if I can do this it was terrifying and um she talked me through it and I would go and shoot my story and then come back write it out get it approved by my producers get into edit, get it really, get, get it going, get the good shell of it where we wanted to go. And then I would say, I'm on my way to the airport. So I pack up my gear, grab my saltines, get in the car, start jamming them in my mouth, call my editor on the way up. We'd talk through the final edits, get into the chopper. We'd get up in the air. We'd find out where our shoot report would be. So it would be like, okay, well, the lead story is down at a courthouse. So we need you to go take a beauty shot down at the courthouse. So then we do that. You'd usually do like three teases and maybe four to five other intros. And then I would do my story. So then I would shoot wherever I was, wherever my story was, switch the camera. It would come back to my face. I'd do my lead and intro, toss it into my story. Story would go, finish the story, come back up to me and then back down to the beauty shop, pass it back. And then I'd do the closing bumpers for the show and whatever. Get down, uh, drive back to the station, find out my night assignment for the evening. Then I would go back out, shoot my story for the evening, usually eat whatever it was on the drive, shoot my story, go back, again, get approved, write my story, edit, and do my live, sometimes in the chopper, but most of the time at that time, I would do my lives um, on the ground. And then I would drive back to Barrie. <laughs> wow. I'm tired just listening to that. I feel like you just told me about four people's <laughs> jobs, not just one. I was in the best shape of my life back then. I got to tell you, it was something. Yeah, I bet. Wow. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I still can't believe you did all of that in, in a day. Um, in over the course of the time in that role, um, I know you mentioned you reported on a lot of different stories, you know, politics, crime, you know, feel good stories, some yep. entertainment in there as well. Yep. Um, and eventually you find out about this new show that that global uh, is launching and you decide to audition. So when take me back to the kind of that audition phase, what did you know about the show um, when you were auditioning? Yeah, well, I think an important part of the story, too, and I thought about this the other day was that before I heard about this entertainment show, something was shifting in me. I, I had been doing hard news. And uh, I was having a really hard time of letting it go, of not feeling and thinking of these people when my day was done. To the point where, <clears throat> you know, those, those, those lines where I remember a mother had lost her daughter and she wanted me to come in and to try on her daughter's clothes because she thought that maybe I should have them at the end of the day. And I remember being like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Like it takes a special person to do the crime beat. It's a really hard, and I did it for a little while. And that by a little while, I mean a little while. Um, and it wasn't the storytelling. It wasn't, it wasn't the complexity of it. It was the emotion of it. Um, and so again, showing them kind of leading people to see where I wanted to go. 
occasionally there would be, oh, we've got the Sturitz first day of school. Who wants to do it? I put my hand up. Because let me do it. Because I would think I'm going to show them that I'm going to make this story that's nothing. First day back to school. No one's going to care about it. I'm going to make it so funny and with some great music. And it's going to be the highlight. It's going to be the thing that everyone's talking about. Again, kind of leading people to see me in a different light, leading them in that direction. So I started doing kicker stories and, and the bosses really liked it. And then I started doing entertainment stories and Backstreet Boys were coming to town and then we'd do a live and I'd have people singing behind me and it, it built this momentum and this feeling to then, which leads to, in my mind, I'm like, like, I just, I love music. Music's my favorite thing. Out of movies, music and acting and TV, music's my thing. Going to the Grammys is like my Super Bowl, my favorite. So I hear that in my mind, I'm like, oh gosh, doing an entertainment show would be amazing. And there were a lot of rumblings at that time in the industry that something was going to happen. And then it was that Global was going to do an entertainment show. And I actually, let me back up. I remember a year before that, I went upstairs to the big bosses and pitched to them. Could I be a correspondent for entertainment tonight? Because it aired on a network. And they're like, oh, no, Cheryl. I'm like, I could be the Canadian. They're like, no, 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 no. Wouldn't work, wouldn't work. Fast forward. So then um, they're going to do an entertainment show. So I'm at, I'm going to audition. So in between my day of shooting my story and doing the things and the things, I'm like, let me audition. So I go on audition, feel like it went well, very nervous, never read a teleprompter a day in my life, like really, really. And we finish and they say, you're not what we're looking for. We don't want someone people know. We don't want blonde hair, blue eye. We're just, it's not what we're looking for. And in television, that happens sometimes. And so I was like, okay, really upset deep inside, but I was like, okay. So I decided to do the rational thing that any normal rational professional woman would do. I went on a massive vacation to Australia to see a boy. That's what I did. <laughs> To go find myself, what I, you know, I'm going to yep. find, I'm going to go find myself, you know, just to figure out what, what, what am I doing? Like I knew <laughs> rumbling, I knew change was coming. I knew I needed to, something was happening within me. So then I went on this vacation. It was wonderful. It was great. All the things I'll tell the boy story another day. I'll leave that. And I come home and I'm fully prepared because at that time they would do the interviews and then they would call you in to tell you that you don't have the job because I worked there. That was kind of what was going to happen. So that whole week I was sitting at my desk and we were in cubicles and I kept seeing these beautiful models and actors and musicians and people walking through that were auditioning for the job. And I was like, oh yeah, no, I'm not getting this job. Like this is not happening. I am not a supermodel. That is not a vibe. Like, no. Nope. Um, and then they asked for a meeting downtown. And I remember on that day, I told you this, it was raining and I talked to my mom on the phone and I was like, okay, they're going to tell me. I just need to be just super calm, super cool. And sometimes when I get fired up, whether I'm angry or sad or mad, I will have a tear. My eyes will leak. And it's not because of weakness. It's just, I don't know if anybody else is out there. I don't think it's a sign of weakness. It's just, it's just what happens. She's like, listen, hold it together. I know you wanted this, but this isn't your path. It's okay. Like, okay. So I get there and I remember sitting in this giant boardroom and Barb Williams was there and Zev Shalev was there. And I'm looking at this giant window facing downtown Toronto. And all I remember them saying is, we'd like you to host this entertainment show. It's going to be called Entertainment Tonight. And by the way, your co-host is Rick Campanelli. If I could have fallen through the floor, I got, it was, and I remember Barb saying to me, are you okay? Can you speak? <laughs> no, because it was the last thing, the last thing I would have imagined. And they're like, well, do you, are you going to take the job? I was like, yes. And then it was just off to the races. I don't even know. And I had imposter syndrome being like, they don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. Like what, what the heck? I told them I know what's up. I don't know what's up. And then that was it. That must have been <laughs> a wild roller coaster of emotions, like going from you know, them basically telling you right off the bat, 
you're not what we're we don't looking want, for. No, yeah. no. And so at that point, you know, yeah, like you go away, you probably have process it. You were starting yeah. to think about what you're going to do instead. And then, yeah. and then you come back and, and, and this happened. So what were those early days of, of the show? Like it was wild. It was a wild time because we had these big press conferences. And for the first time they wanted me out front speaking for the group. Boo, 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 boo. And the reality is I'm incredibly shy. I'm a homebody. I'm, I, I, yeah. So it was really difficult for me. I love doing stuff on camera, like you're and I doing here, but if I go out in a big crowd and a big thing, I like internally, I'm losing it. Always have been that way. So maybe that's why I love television so much because I can kind of, you know, uh, part of the reason why I joined a speaker series is because if I don't continue to speak publicly in like on a stage, I will stop doing it all together and it will never happen. So anyway, um, those early days were wild. It was the executives from CBS came down, like the big guys, the presidents of CBS, because this is their baby. Like Entertainment Tonight is their baby. And we're telling them we're gonna, have, we're gonna do a sister show. There was pressure. And the, we did rehearsals for weeks and then they decided we we're gonna launch it during film festival, which is only the busiest time in entertainment, right? That wow. and award show season. Mm -hmm. So that very first day, I remember, you know, we were still working out of trailers in the back and our studio had just like the paint was drying on the set. You could still smell the paint. And the executives were behind the wall, all lined up as I'm shooting the show. Um, and I remember we got one day done and I was like, okay, now I have to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> And then it was like being shot out of a cannon. I was traveling all over the world. I was gone more than I was home. Um, like every weekend you'd get on a red eye on a Friday night and take off and get back on a red eye on a Monday and start shooting the show. And it just went, mm, 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 and it was, it was crazy. Yeah. Wow. It must've been like hard to, to kind of catch your breath, uh, in, in those yeah. early days. Yeah, it yeah. was, it was really it was, it was an interesting time and I really had to just dig in. Um, and, you know, I will say in those early days, and I don't think people talk about this enough, it took a big toll on my social life and on my personal life. Like I lost friends over them saying, you focus on work too much. And it was super heartbreaking, but it really did, that really did happen. And it wasn't because I didn't love my friends. It was, um, a couple of them just weren't like it, you know, didn't understand that I had this commitment to all these people. And it wasn't just to the people in front of me. It was to the people in LA. It was, a, it was a really big thing. And uh, I wasn't home much and I was exhausted, you know? So the, you know, the very beginning of doing anything, sometimes you have to dive all in and it's really hard. Yeah. I mean, and I, I think it's really, I'm glad that you, that you kind of mentioned that because I do think sometimes, um, life in, in, in TV and in broadcasting does get really glamorized. And of course there are a lot of those moments, but there's also a lot of hard work, a lot of late nights, early mornings, mm. a lot of flights, like you mentioned. Um, I know you've, you've told so many fascinating stories about your career. I know if for all of you who have joined us tonight, I, if I'm sure some of you have your own questions as well. So feel free to, to type them, um, in the chat and the, the last little bit here, we're going to do some audience questions, um, for you, Cheryl. Um, mm -hmm. but getting back to some of, uh, some of kind of those harder days, what did, keep you going um during some of the tougher moments in your career i just think no has never been an option like not finding a way to make it work for myself has never been an option i always feel like when there's a no just go find the yes go figure it out and when things get hard um i just go and try and find the good in it you know, and I think my mom is the woman who's the, she lives with rose colored glasses and we make fun of her a lot of the time for that. Um, but I think even in the hardest of times when things were busy and people were maybe not, you know, as supportive as I wish that they were, 
Um, and even boyfriends, there were times that their relationships fell apart sometimes. Um, I, you know, you just try to find the good. You try to find the, the positive in, in it and what you're doing. And is it worth it? And are, does, it, does, it make, does it make your soul happy? And doing my job and talking with people and, and, and doing this makes me happy, you know? I know something else in your life that, um, that also makes you happy is uh, your family. Of course, you've been married uh, since 2008. You have two children. Um, I know like many people, you were working from home um, during the peak of the pandemic. I think you just yeah. went back to the studio recently. I did. Yeah. So how did that change um, life at home for you? In every way. <laughs> it changed in every way. I mean, gosh, I did the show right from here um, every single night. And oftentimes uh, my children would come in and ask for a snack or in the middle of an interview, I remember I was interviewing Kristen Bell and Jackson came in and he's like, Hey, who's that? And, and then he started talking to her and she's like, Hey, my name's Kristen. What's your name? He's like, Jackson. She's like, I wrote a book it's called purple people. He's like, Oh yeah. And so then they, and I just sat back and I was like, okay, this is what we're doing. So, you know, dogs have come in and come out. It, you know, it's changed everything. I think it's, I think, I think it's really loosened up. It's loosened up that relationship with viewer and myself, um, which I'm so grateful for, because I think it's so important for people to see who you really are, because all the hairspray and the, the fancy dresses and the makeup and the thing, you can get your news anywhere. You can get it. You can get it anywhere. You can get it on the internet. You can, there's a million shows. But if you like the person that that's delivering it and you, and you connect with them, whether it's something they say or a point of view or they make you think or whatever, I think it's really allowed for people to be connected. And certainly before all of this, celebrities were very tight lipped on the questions that they would ask. You know this, when you go to do an interview, the PR people will tell you, well, they don't want to talk about this and they don't want to talk about this and they don't want to talk about this. And then if you start on that, the PR people will rush in. Well. In this scenario, we'd be doing Zooms with people and they'd be showing us around their house, like things loosened up, people, celebrities loosened up and they started to, to share more than they ever have before because they were bored and, and then it became the normal. So this beautiful balance of it used to be they're not going to talk about anything unless it's on their own social media, it really opened up in a really beautiful way. So I think, I think that's a big part of how it changed. Yeah, I think it really for um, kind of humanized everyone, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I think that that's definitely um, for all the the challenges and the tragedy that that has happened. I think that that is definitely one silver lining. I think we've all learned to to be a little kinder to each other too. Um, and and, and I think that. I think you're totally right. And I think it also has put a focus on family in the most beautiful way. And reminded us that for such a long time, we were all going and going and going and going and oh, little family time, oh, little, you know, and it really reminded everybody how important family is and kind of rebalanced everything. Now it's like you go in, get your work done and you get home to your people. And so I, I hope a lot of that continues. Yeah, I, I hope you're right. Um, I know um, we kind of talked a little bit about how you have innovated through your career. And um, aside from, you know, hosting um, ET Canada, you also um, have your own uh, brand, uh, Cheryl Home and Family. So, so tell me about that. And, and how did that come to be as kind of part of your, uh, your evolution and your brand? Yeah, I mean, everything I do always comes back to family, whether at the beginning it was my mom, my brother and my sister and my dad. Uh, everything always kind of came back to them. And certainly when I had kids, that focus became even more narrow and just really, um, and I, I created something for my son very early on, uh, a breastfeeding bottle feeding pillow. And I knew that I wanted to, to create more comfort products for the entire family. So we, we tested it in market for a couple of years and went well, and I was like, Ooh, and then we found some really great business partners and we decided to launch and then a pandemic hit. We were like, oh, can we do it? So we gave it a go. We launched the company and now we're in HomeSense and Best Buy and uh, gosh, where are we? Online at Walmart and Winners. And of course you can buy our products at Cheryl's Home and Family.ca. We've got weighted blankets. 
all the comfort products. I love, I love the, love the focus on, on comfort and, and being cozy yeah. at home. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I, you also have, um, evolved in your social media. You have like such a great presence on, on TikTok and Instagram as well. Um, I love following you there. I know we've taken, you know, this really cool journey, um, in the last 40 minutes through your career, also through, through your life as well. Um, it's been so interesting to hear how you got started, how you're still keeping things fresh and continuing to evolve as you kind of look, I know we did a kind of a lot of looking back, but I'm curious as you look forward now, what are you most excited about? Oh gosh. Um, what am I most excited about? just about the possibilities of like, where are we going next? What's happening? You know, I, I have a lot of ideas. I got to do a really great show on HGTV um, called, um, oh my gosh, I just, <laughs> like, what was it called? Family Home Overhaul. Yes. This is a problem. Um, uh, called Family Home Overhaul. And it was right before the pandemic hit. Uh, we helped eight families whose homes were completely falling apart. Um, and we, you know, rejuvenated their homes right before the pandemic hit. Uh, and that was such a great, beautiful, blessed opportunity that I got to be a part of that program and that show. And so I'm hoping more opportunities like that come up. Um, I have a couple ideas that I've pitched here and there. I just really love television. And I, you know, I just want to keep doing more, you know. Well, we're certainly excited to, to watch that evolution. And um, I'm so appreciative of you sharing your story with us today. It was such a pleasure to have Cheryl as our first guest and to kick off this season and our partnership with Fanshawe College with that live event. We're actually going to have more of those events throughout the year as well. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, if you enjoyed the show, we hope you'll leave us a five-star review. You can also find me on social media at Priya Sam. Let me know what you thought of the episode. Thanks again for joining us. And until next time, take good care of yourselves and of each other.